Hi, welcome to the Q&A recording of the film. Once you know, playing as part of 10th European Union uh, Human Rights Film Base. Joining us now is the director of the film, Emmanuel Capelin, uh, from France. Hi, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so after studying environmental studies, you continue uh, your education with film and started exploring the relationship between humans and uh, planet Earth. Uh, you have been collaborating with young artist Bernhard uh, Bertrand for, for a while on his well-known films such as Human and Woman. Uh, and Once You Know is your first feature film. So there are many reasons why a filmmaker makes a film. Uh, the reasons could be professional, personal, or artistic. Uh, could you share some of the reasons why did you make, make this particular film? Well, uh, that's, I will try to make a short answer to that because it was a very long process. Uh, as some of you know, it, it, it was uh, eight years in the making, this film, once you know. So um, the, the reasons evolved over time. But uh, even before we st started making the film and, and writing it in, in 2012, um, there were some deeper uh, uh, desires for this film, I think. Uh, maybe not completely conscious. And, and part of it, I think, is the subject, so climate change um, and global, uh, global change, as we call it, global environmental change are, are subjects that I have been studying uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, I, I, I was very fortunate to interview some of the um, best um, scientists on these issues uh, around the world and meeting them and seeing how these, this, their toxic knowledge, we could call it, had impacted their lives. Um, made me think, I was doing interviews for other projects, uh, for Yann Artus Bertrand, as you, as you mentioned it, uh, for, for a project called uh, um, Climate Voices, and we were interviewing just climate survivors around the world, and, uh, and the scientists were supposed to give us sort of the context of what, why this was happening, but what I discovered was they were also being part of the context and being impacted themselves, and so I started thinking, why don't, why don't we talk to these people who have been uh, exposed for so many years to these questions and then um, this will give us an idea of how we will be experiencing climate change maybe 10 20 30 years from now when we have the level of knowledge that they have mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just scientific knowledge it's of, it's of course all of the human and social consequences uh, of climate impacts mm -hmm. and this is how it started it was really just a, a film about scientists and slowly it became more and more personal and as you mentioned it uh, the personal, the intimate, and, and ultimately the artistic came into play. And I tried to make a film that was kind of a hybrid between a, a science film um, and a more of a social issues and a, an, a, an, an art essay. And it's kind of a mixture of these different things. Yes, I was going to uh, ask it actually. In your film, uh, both you and the world's uh, leading scientists such as Dennis Meadows, Jean-Marc Giancovici, Pablo Servin are asking very important questions about the future of our existence and our planet, uh, which is at the edge of collapse. Yet at the same time, it is quite an intimate and personal film. Uh, you tell us your personal story since you first realized uh, that our economic behavior is going to be uh, deadly both for us and for our planet, actually. So um, you show us how your personal opinion is changed through the years. Uh, is this something you planned since you first decided to make this movie? or And uh, how did you feel after you completed uh, the film? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question because uh, actually uh, it was not the case at all. I, I was, I, my, my trade is uh, um, camera operating. So I, I'm very comfortable behind the camera, but I'm not comfortable in front of the camera. So I was very happy to have these great scientists in front of the camera telling me everything I wanted to hear, but I wasn't going to do it myself. And then, I've been working on this film for uh, many years uh, with a great accomplice who is uh, Anne-Marie Sangla. She is the editor of the film. As filmmakers know, editors are always extremely important in the process of filmmaking, but she was particularly important here, and I consider her to be a co-author and, and co-director of the film because she brought so much uh, um, artistic direction, I should say. And one of the things she told me at one point was, look, Emmanuel, you can't ask the scientist to be intimate, to be vulnerable in front of the camera if you're not going to play that game yourself. Mm. And this was really a turning point where it, it, it took a while. It was a, long, a slow curve, but 
slowly I started to include myself in the film and the fact that I became a father and started filming my son growing up also helped me um, sort of feel that it was not just about me, but also me as a father, as a citizen, and, and that the story was not just about my little self, but a, a, a more universal story. Mm -hmm. This combination, I think it perfectly works. So uh, it's a good thing <laughs> that you did this, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, in your film, Richard Heinberg is saying something important. Um, if seven and a half billion of us want to have just a nice house and a not big car, it doesn't sound like much. And yet we are destroying the planet and future generations in order to get it. So um, we are aware that this motivation of human uh, will cause the ecosystem to collapse and uh, it will be the end of us, uh, for us as well. In your film, you're exploring the individual uh, political economic solutions to this dead end. Um, as a filmmaker, what do you think about the role of documentaries in, in this historical uh, confliction moment? Do you think they have the power to change the opinions of people and get them uh, moved, maybe? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to be very honest. Uh, I think uh, we never save anything but ourselves inside or outside of filmmaking. Uh, everything we do is really always about our relationship to the world, uh, even though it might be very altruistic and, and, and very uh, you know, done in solidarity with others. Uh, we never ever save others. We, we, we only do it. And so I think this film, um, it was cathartic for me as, as an artist, uh, as a filmmaker. Uh, I was very fortunate to have the t to, to be able to go all the way with this very long process. Um, but what I do think it does is that it allows other people to go through that process themselves. Um, so it's not going to change the world, but it's going to uh, maybe give permission to some people to say, oh, what I've been feeling inside this kind of what we call eco-anxiety and this need to react to that um, and not just, you know, try to deny it and, and, and shove it deep inside us. Um, um, maybe I can express it. Maybe it's a legitimate fear. Maybe it's uh, a fear that is shared with others and maybe uh, we can meet around those, 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 those uh, emotions. I, you know, emotion, emotion is what puts you into motion, into movement. And so when you actually accept the emotions that are, being, are going through you, uh, whether it's angst or anger or sadness with these um, deeply uh, existential questions that are the disappearance of the world we have learned to love and to, that we have adapted for you know, hundreds of thousands of years, um, once we accept these emotions, they actually are extremely powerful drivers. And, so, and I'm very happy you mentioned uh, Richard Heinberg when he talks about you know, all of us just wanting a nice little, you know, we don't, everybody is talking about uh, the big bad guys, you know, who are co consuming so much. But what is actually happening is that we have too many people having too much power. And that power is just the power of buying a car and having two kids and uh, using fossil fuels to, to run our, our current lifestyles. And I think this is one of the, the mental shifts, you know, when we talk about social change and how movies can influence uh, the public discourse or the public conversation. I think one of the little ideas I would like to push forward with this film is that even if we go uh, French Revolution style in the future, if we start cutting the heads of all the rich people and saying, you know, we want more equality, well, the next day, with all this blood on our hands, we will still have a collapsing world because the medium cl middle class is destroying the world. And the middle class is not just in the US, it's in France, it's in all the developing countries. And so it's a, it's a much more profound problem than just the problem of inequality, which is also a very real problem. And so this, we have to be able to hold these two things in our hands at the same time. Yes, we have a huge inequality problem and needs to be addressed because otherwise, you know, blood will take care of it. And we have a huge overpower problem generally as as humans since we've had fossil fuels on our hands and and this overpower is is what is destroying us and so it's it's a, it's very difficult because there are no more bad guys that we just need to get rid of and the, the solution will come forward it's a much more complex problem and i hope the film can tr try to say this that um, 
um, yeah. we all, everyone, everyone in the in the developing in the developed world, in the developing world, basically, it's I mean, eighty percent of humanity needs to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. it's a very global conversation. Yeah, I mean, related to this issue, I would like to ask something about the timing of the film, actually. Um, it's really interesting that you made this film uh, just before the breakout of COVID-19. This global pandemic is uh, actually part of the climate, cri climate change crisis. So now the questions you are raising with your film uh, became even more important. Uh, so what do you think and how do you feel about this coincidence? Have you become more hopeful about the future with the COVID experience or the contrary? <laughs> um, well, I, I think one of the uh, positive things with this crisis is that for the first time, I think, in the history of humanity, we are experiencing having a common ex shared experience. So it's, it's very different based on our, our, our lifestyles, you know, how much uh, medical coverage there is in the country where we live, but we are having to face a common threat all together at the same time. And at the very end of the film, um, I, I speak of uh, the possibility for a post-collapse uh, uh, planetary identity to, to rise. Uh, and, 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 I, and I wonder, you know, can we at the same time be more relocalized, not so, so global, because this is the problem with uh, the, our global lifestyles is they're very energy dependent. So if we have less energy tomorrow, can we be re more relocalized? And at the same time, can we have a planetary identity so that we don't sort of crystallize identities around um, you know, uh, race or nations or things like that. And, and uh, I, I think this kind of experience that we're having right now is, is creating this collective uh, identity. And I think that's quite positive in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's one of the symptoms of a, systems breaking, a system breaking down. And uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to go all the way. I mean, we, can, we, have, we have leeway for some kind of, of you know, economic uh, resilience. Uh, I mean, it's going to be very hard in the months to come and the years to come. I, I'm, I'm personally convinced of that. But I, do, but I also think that it's possible to stop kind of the domino effect where you know, um, financial breakdown leads to economic breakdown, leads to social breakdown, leads to cultural breakdown. Uh, I think we can stop that uh, vicious cycle uh, if we act pro at the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't think, oh, this is the beginning of the end of times. COVID has come. No, I, I don't think that. But I do think that uh, it is putting on the map what you know, a lot of systems thinkers have been trying to speak about for decades. People like Dennis Meadows, who I was exchanging emails with yesterday, just yesterday. And um, he, um, he has been trying to explain what is systemic vulnerability. And, and it's a complex idea to understand. And right now, I think it's possible for anyone to understand what is systemic vulnerability because we are experiencing it in the flesh. So in that sense, I think it's positive to, to be able to face other kinds of systemic uh, risks. Yeah. Like uh, when, uh, as you mentioned in your film, maybe localization uh, will going to be one of the solutions uh, to this uh, problem. So um, Emmanuel, thank you very much for sharing your film with us and joining our uh, Q&A session. Um, and good luck with your future works. Well, I, I would like to end by thanking uh, the, f the festival for selecting the film because um, you're the first uh, festival to uh, select us more on the uh, human rights um, uh, perspective. And it's, it's very important for me because this is what climate change is really about. It's about our capacity to continue to live in peace. Uh, and this is going to be the main factor for peace and, and, and conflict in the future. And so... I'm really happy that we're linking climate change and, and, um, and human rights. This is, this is, a, this is the, heart, the heart of the question, really. Exactly. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.